One interesting fact about center drills is that if you want to get the maximum diameter on the drill, when you when you drill, it's a, equal to the diameter of the shank. See, so if this is a three quarter inch shank center drill, and the depth you go to is about is three quarters of an inch to get to the maximum size of the diameter of the taper on, on standard ground center drills. finished roughing this this part down from the stock I left an eighth of an inch on the radius or, or a quarter of an inch on the diameter larger and a hundred thousandths on the faces all of these faces here and this is the way let me let me rotate the chuck if I can do this and see we have pretty minimal run out with the tail center in there but then let me uh let me retract the tail center Let's see what we have. It's actually going off the indicator here. Let's see. So we got, what's that, about 15, 20 thousandths or so run out. So that's the stress in the material. It's the reason I leave stock on it. So I'm going to rough this part I've already roughed. I'm going to rough the other one and then I'm going to put them back in, skim a little steady rest band on here to reclaim my center on the end of the part to finish turning it for finish turning. It's the way this stock is because when you take all of this material off of that 
But that big round bar like this, here, you relieve stress in the material. Although this isn't really as bad as I've seen some of them. All right, we have the part here on the crane. I'm gonna put it in the chuck. We're gonna use the original, here, the original tail center to um, use on the tail stock for the moment. But it's important, it's important that we get uh, this chucked in here and running true with the minimal amount of stress in, introduced back into the part. Because otherwise you're just going to turn it and it's just going to bow. And you're going to have problems after you finish machining. And these rough feed lines on the, on the OD of the stock here, you can't see them, but they, they grip the jaws. Even though I've only got a half an inch of depth on these jaws, they grip them very tightly. And it's kind of hard to get this to line up when you, if you tighten the jaws too tight. Here, so you've got to be kind of, kind of work it a little at a time. I think. I've got the tailstock pressure turned way down too. So I'm going to just extend this into here, into the center. You've got to be careful you hit the center here. Just to hold the part up for the moment. Start to indicate this part in. We'll get it running reasonably true at the chuck without too much pressure on the jaws here minimal pressure that we can still hold the part and release it without it falling down. Which I don't, I don't know, like I mentioned before, these, there's these heavy feed lines on this OD and, it, and you don't, it doesn't take too much force even though there's a very little chuck jaw holding onto this part to, to make it so you can't even hardly tap it in, to run true down here. But it's important even though we've got it sitting in the tail center to um, get it to run true up here, then release the tail center, make sure it's still running true down here within a reasonable amount so that we're not introducing some more stress by the, the tail center pulling the part and causing stress in it. And then we turn it and release it and it's, and it's bowed. The reason I tip this at 45 degrees is it gives me more clearance with the um, wrench and the spindle and everything on things. It's not absolutely necessary, but it just makes things a little easier. Otherwise you're down here and you're hitting things with the Y axis. As I said in videos before, I'm gonna kind of get the indicator on the high spot here. And I'm gonna zero it on the hundred thousandths on here and the zero on the big needle. I'm not gonna worry about anything but the two jaws 180 degrees apart from each other. So we're gonna rotate uh, around 180. I'm gonna see where we're at. See, we're not too far off, only 10 thousandths, we gotta come up. But in this case, I'm not, I don't wanna to put too much tension, like I said before on these jaws, cause it's very difficult to uh, move the part because of these heavy, I don't know if you can hear that, I'm running my fingernail over these feed lines. Then I'm going to re-zero the indicator. Now I've got a, a rough zero of where I'm heading for. I'm going to run it 180 degrees again just to double check that. And see it's pretty close to zero. So now I can adjust these other two set of jaws. This one has to be tightened at the top here. I 
All right, that should be running pretty true already, but you see it is. Now, this part is just roughed right now. It's like an eighth of an inch of material or a quarter inch on the diameter to come off. So that would be plenty good enough right there. But now I'm gonna run it out here to the tailstock end of it. Go, let me jog it down here. I have to move the camera a little bit. It's gonna hit this steady wrist jaw. I'm gonna jog it down to get a reading on the indicator. More or less the same as I had before at, over at the chuck. The, the small needle on 100 and the larger one on zero. And we're gonna see what happens here when we release the, the tail stock. Hopefully I've got enough tension on those jaws, the part just doesn't fall. We'll see. It might, you might see a jump in the indicator here. This tailstock is is a tendency to, I think it's pushing it up a little bit to get things to run true just a little. Now we're going to run this around. And what we want to do here, see this is the high spot right here. Okay, what I'm going to do is hit the hit the face of this um, flange at the bottom here to see if I can move the part. pretty tight. This is what I was talking about. See those, those jaws get an incredible grip on the part. Can't move it. To loosen those jaws just a little bit. Now let's come back to the high. Okay, this is a high spot. Let's see if I can tap it down. Okay. <clears throat> it's better. I can tap it down a little bit more. What I want to do is get this running pretty true down here. Now I am making the assumption that this rough turned OD ran concentric to this center. I'm gonna check that in a second here. But first I'm just getting it up here right now. That's not too bad now. Let's see if we can get this indicator on the, on the center itself down here. See if I can show you that. See if we can get it on the center itself. Won't be the best angle for this kind of indicator, but it'll give us an idea. Got to watch up here on my tail stop, on my, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to reach this. I'm gonna have to move the tailstock out of the way. It's gonna, it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit right here on the tail center. So let me, let me move that out of the way. That'll be the easiest thing to do right here. Got to come back up here to get the dog. There's a, there's a dog that clamps into the tail center. Move it back a little bit. That should be far enough. 
Now let's see if we can get down here on this. So. On this actual center drill on the part. Let's say the indicator is not going to be at a very good angle, but it'll still give us an idea. We can find the not the best angle on the indicator, but we'll see. Okay, so ideally I should actually get this to run true because this is going to be machined down. Let's see if I can get this a little better than it is. I think I went too far. Whoa. on the flange now parts moved a little bit away from the chuck jaws to where I can hit on it now that looks pretty darn good there so what I'm gonna attempt to do now is tighten these chuck jaws up down to this end and see if I can maintain that run out zero the indicator so I can know where I'm at okay I'm not too awfully concerned about the chuck end of it because I know I have a I have an eighth of an inch of material down there. I just got it running reasonably true. What I want is this center to run true actually. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. You can see there's really no deflection at all on that center. But I'm gonna come back over here to the chuck end of it, just to check it. Just to see how true this is running down here it, it really like I say it doesn't make a lot of difference down here hopefully it's running reasonably true because we are, we have an eighth of an inch eighth of an inch of material to come off let's see if it's running within you know even 20 thousandths down here would be fine it's running all oh, about five thousandths out now I've got the chuck jaws pretty tight. And I think I'm going to be happy with that. So now I'm going to bring the center back up and we're going to engage it. And we're going to finish roughing the OD down to within about 20 thousandths or 30 thousandths too big still. And we're going to skim a little spot for the um, steady rest even after that. Just in case we introduced a little more run out. We'll, we'll check it after we rough it and uh, we're going to do the end work which is there's a um, just a one inch hole drilled up halfway up into the part see that 
that dog right there that has to engage on the the tail center has a um piston hydraulic piston thing or, or pin that shoots out and engages that so that i can drag it when it's unclamped all right we're going to bring this center forward got to actually watch these uh down here these way covers i'm going to collapse them all the way to their maximum so we have enough travel with the quill here to extend it into the center now. I have very little pressure on the tail stock, as you can see there. Just about, oh, what is that, about a thousand pounds? Or maybe less than that. I don't know how good that meter reads when it's, the gauge reads how accurate it is when it's down that low. But I don't want too much pressure. on the tail center, you know, might introduce a force on this part. Normally, normally I run this at around 2,000 pounds on that gauge for the most part. Now, when you change the pressure of that, it does kind of change things, how straight they turn. And so you have to adjust this. This tail stock has this, um, it's kind of like a, a cam this, I don't know if you can see it here, kind of hard to see, but the actual spindle of the tail center runs off center in the quill. So when you, um, when you turn this mechanism here, it rotates the whole quill in the tail stock and you can adjust the, the center. And, and you're really turning straight in this way on this machine, so you, can, you want to move it up and down. Now, theoretically, this would move it off center a little bit in the Y axis when you turn this thing. But it turns out that's not enough to worry about. It's very little air in theory that might tend to turn the parts, you know, I, I don't know which way it would go, either barrel shaped or this way, but it doesn't really um, move it enough in the Y to make uh, too much difference in that respect. And it actually ends up turning very straight once you get it adjusted. And it's very easy to, to sort of tweak this thing in. You put a 10th indicator, that's kind of the reason I had the 10th indicator here on my uh, mag base. To so stick it down here on the um, steady rest and I put it on there. Well, actually in this case, I stick it on the spindle and I run it up and down when I turn the first finish turn and I make sure that I'm turning straight and I mic it. I say I got to adjust it a certain amount and you can do it very easily by turning this cam thing and it, it um, rotates this. It's really a nice feature. The newer machines, the newer Mazaks don't have this this way and then you have to do other stuff, program tapers and everything and it's not as nice. I want to forget about setting my uh, fixture offset. It's kind of easy to forget things when you're doing these videos. So I want to set my Z, I want to set my Z zero to take about 50 thousandths stock off the face there. I'm going to come down here with the hammer indicator, get it sort of close to Y zero and then jog it in here to the zero point. So that would make the zero right on the face. Now we got to go to the control here. People have asked me this, so I thought I'd show it. What we want to do here is um, go to the fixture or work offset. We run the cursor down to the Z axis. You can see that. We're going to select the teach button and we're going to go minus 50 thousandths. So we're going to teach the offset another minus 50 thousandths in. And we'll push the input. We're going to hit reset on the position display and verify that we're setting it 50 thousandths plus in Z. So that's how you do that. 
Now this machine, you have to have the, the B at zero degrees, the B axis, in order to remove or insert tools. I guess it's some kind of safety feature to keep the tool horizontal. It just doesn't fall out of the spindle when you unclamp it. We've already roughed off the OD, as you saw. Let's check this run out. Now I have this um, I have this tenth indicator here because I'm using it to set my uh, tailstock with, and I already had it in the magnetic base, so it might might be hard to show it with this if it's more than a few thousands. But let's see what happens. Okay, this this is with the tailstock in. run out you see it might be the feed lines actually in the roughing right at the moment now let me back the tailstock off you're gonna see the part probably um you can see a lot of deviation here because when you back off the tailstock you have the weight of the part on the spindle and everything so let's see what happens okay as expected to readjust the indicator here see how much uh or if the runout's any different with the tailstock out of the way. It's a little bit more, it's a thousandth and a half. So what we're going to do actually is up here, we're gonna skim a little area with the part setting just like this so we can close the steady rest on it and we can do the end work and after we do the end work the center the the tailstock center here is going to be riding on the hole that we make in the end of the part so if everything's running true there again after that then we're going to go and finish turn the OD so let me get the um, finishing tool down here and we'll just skim a little bit on this OD here. Start at about 250 RPM maybe. And set the feed rate here before I get going too far. I want to set the jog feed rate. Okay, about four thousandths per revolution now. I'm gonna jog it down to where I start to cut a little bit. Let's see here, it's hard for me to see this. Let's 
feet along here, get a band wide enough for the steady rollers to grab on. Just enough to clean it up. I'm just jogging it by hand here, doing all this by hand. You have to be kind of careful when you're doing something way out here. I'm probably, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 inches away from the chuck here. Don't want to get too carried away with trying to cut too heavy a cut. The finish, from where I can see, I don't know, you might be able to see better with the camera because you're closer than I am. It doesn't look too bad. I want to get a sort of decent finish on this to run the rollers on. And of course, it's important that it runs concentric to the spindle. Almost there. We've got to turn about a three inch wide section here for the, the rollers and the wipers on the ends of the steady rest arms to run on. Keep Try to keep shavings best we can out from under the rollers. This is always a battle, continual battle when you're running a steady rest is shavings getting under the rollers. Although if it dents the part in this case, it wouldn't be real serious, but if you're running on finished diameters or something like that, the rollers will still leave a mark, but you don't want dents. It's like it's doing pretty good. Like I said, we're running 250 RPM and one inch per minute or four thousandths per revolution. That's what that says on the control here. Almost there. Kind of just eyeballing this in relation to the steady rest. Jaws. Okay. Probably be good enough. Stop the spindle. Open the doors. I jogged it a little bit away from the the um I don't know, there seems like there's not too bad. I think I'm gonna leave that be. Now we gotta clean all the steady jaws off. There's a bunch of shavings. I'll show you down here. There's a whole bunch of shavings down there and everything. We've got to clean all that. Got to clean all that up. Make sure there's nothing there. I like to kind of wipe off these rollers a little bit too on this. Need to go put some oil in the lubricator. There's a lubricator on the end of the machine for this steady rest, but it tends to just run continuously. So I only put a small amount of oil at a time in it when I'm using the steady rest so that it, um, it doesn't, it, it, otherwise it'll just flow a bunch of oil through it and it'll run all over the place and just waste oil. So I just put enough to where I'm running the steady rest. Here's the, here's the lubricator on the end of the machine. I gotta put a little bit of oil in this. I just put enough, just a little bit of oil in this because if I fill it up full, like I said earlier, It'll just run continuously and run the oil through the steady rest, whether I'm using it or not. And it gets in the chip pan, you know, chip conveyor and everything. Uh, so I just put enough in here to get it to go a little bit. 
and this this I've determined is about the amount I need to reset it. So right now it's setting. Let's see if I can do this without spilling too much. It's uh it's setting on empty. The float switch inside the the reservoir is. Well, let me see actually if I can uh, if I can get close enough here. You can see it maybe. I'll read the display. I don't know if you can see that right now. It's on a low level. And so if I push this little button here, it should reset, and you'll see pressure on the gauge. So, but then see when the oil gets down here, like at this low. It goes back up to low level and it stops. So I want to make sure I'm getting lubrication to the steady rest bearings. And it pumps that, there's a lubricating line here, right here, and it pumps it up through the arms and into the bearings. So we get some uh, lubrication. So let me close the, uh, steady rest here and see what we got going. Now we're going to check something here too. We're going to check the if we're getting any deflection with this steady rest because things change and it can vary. So after I move the tailstock away, we're going to uh, indicate this uh, center and see if we get any kind of deviation when we clamp this and unclamp this as well. So that also can of course put stress in the part or a hole that we're going to actually machine here on the end, you know, drill and then we're going to, it's going to have a chamfer and the, this steady rest is going to kind of, I mean this tailstock is going to kind of run on the chamfer we leave there and we want everything to be running through so that when we do our final turn down this OD, everything will be running through and not being stressing, put any stress back in the shaft. Okay, let's get rid of this uh, tailstock here. We gotta, again, grab a hold of that dog with a shot pin. There, we engage it. It's got some kind of sensors behind the, the, the way covers there that sense when it's in the right location. So you put it in a mode, what they call a um, tail body connect mode on the control here, and then you, you can jog it with the jog key until it, it knows when it's lined up because you can't see it back there. It's kind of a, I don't know, there's some kind of proximity sensors or something in there that can tell when the, when the tailstock is lined up to that, to the dog. You see the dog right there on the, this is the one up here. I'll jog this back. This one up here on the front is for the steady rest, which if I blow it off a little bit. And the one in the back, there's for the tailstock or our tail stock body actually the the quill is run by a separate deal but you can you can actually do this automatically you can put it in the program to do all that and move it back and forth but i generally don't do that when i'm doing things like this because i want to make sure that i have things right and there's no shavings under the rollers and everything but it can be done automatically in a program you can go down there pick up the tail center's body and bring it forward clamp it and then extend the quill into the part and i've done that very rarely now what i'm going to do is is change back to tool number 80 which is the tool i use for um well if i had a spindle probe in the machine it would be for the spindle probe but i use it for the indicating things and everything because on this machine other tools have offsets on them turning tools in particular and a turning tool will offset it the display on the mesotrol wouldn't be so on on machines that are like for nook controls and things like that but on the mesotrol it actually uh, applies the offset to the displayed number on the on the display and and you can't tell if you're on center line so you have to have a tool that's on center you can 
You can indicate stuff like with um, with milling tools and things like that, but as far as um, lathe tools, you have to be kind of careful because most lathe tools have these offsets in two different directions, one for the length and one for the, the distance the tool is off center. And if you're looking at your display and thinking you're at the X and Y center, you, you really aren't because it has the offset in the X direction. So what we're gonna do is come down here. I'm gonna set this on where I think machine X, Y, zero is according to the offset. And then we're going to, um, I'm gonna check to see if we're getting any deflection from that with this uh, steady rest. Just to be safe, just to be, you know, careful. We want to make sure that it's on zero. It'll deflect a little bit. You saw it move here. Like a couple of thousandths or so, or a thousandth or so, a thousandth and a half. And what we're, um, So it looks like it's high, or it's pushing the part. See here. We want the part to come upward, actually, a little bit. So there's adjustments on this steady rest. Let's see if I can do this without hitting the camera. See these four big bolts that hold the steady rest. You can't move it with those um, adjustment screws. unless you have these backed off a little bit. Okay, now we got those loosened enough to where we can actually do an adjustment here. When I loosen the screws, things changed a little bit. We actually have to come down with it. There's nothing that actually forces it down. The only, only thing these adjustment screws on the bottom here do is, is push it upward. So I might have to hit it with the dead blow a little bit. To make it go down. It's kind of hard to move this thing down. So I want to go down. Make sure these bolts are not too snug. Usually you have to hit it back here. Back the screws off a little bit. I know this seems like a hassle and in, in normal turning, you don't really have to do this. I mean, it's, it's not that far off to where it it affects you too much. Now I actually intentionally went too far so that I can bring it back upward the amount I want. Okay, Let's see where we're at here. Gotta go a little bit more. Kind of hard to get to this adjustment screw on the bottom. 
and see what's happening. A little bit more. I can't really, uh, I can't really look at the indicator at the same time, unfortunately. Okay. Now this has to go that way. Now Mazak saw fit to make everything that takes a different size wrench So you have to pull out all different kinds of wrenches here. What we're trying to do is get this thing to indicate on center where we were sitting. Might have gone too far with the up upward direction. Let's see if it'll come down a little bit on its own. This is uh, important in the case of this part. Normally. Normally, like I say, I don't worry too much about this unless it's very, uh, very critical because it's close enough. I don't know if that center hole is round actually. That's pretty good. We're going to call that good enough right now. And I'm going to tighten these down a little bit. The, the, um, I'm, right now I'm tight and snugging up the, the four big bolts that hold the steady rest to the mount.
how good we did with this run out business okay this is it setting on the center as you would expect it's running true remember this is a a one-tenth indicator so it's very sensitive now we're going to retract the the center and it's going to fall down a little bit because of the weight of the part readjust the indicator See how, see how good we did with the run out business here. Not too bad. I mean, I could, it's about a thousandth of an inch. Maybe a little bit more, 1.2 thousandths. Not too bad for, for being all the way down there, 34 inches to the end of the part, and then probably another 12 inches to the spindle. So that's not too bad. I'm not totally unhappy with that. Funny, the part's kind of magnetic after that. Let me see if I can show you. See, this is my air hose and it, it sticks to it. I don't know if you can see that on the video or not, but it, it actually is sticking. Maybe I could take a, maybe a file would. See how it's magnetic? Kind of weird. It's slightly magnetic, enough to hold that file on there. See what we have run out now after no center. Maybe about seven ten thousandths or so. Six or seven. So that's not too bad. So you know you don't you know you don't have any stress in the material. See I could push on this and move it. that much just just laying the weight of my hand on there moves it a little I wanted to make uh, some video clips of machining this end of the part the flange end but I uh, I ran out of time and I have to deliver these parts today and I just didn't have time to work with the video on this but this is the way I chucked onto it I built a or I machined a bushing out of aluminum and split it with the saw 
so that I could grip onto this here and not not mar the part up with the jaws of the chuck even though these are soft jaws and uh, because I was going to tap it around to get this to get this back face um, running true and then adjust the jaws here to get the OD running true so that I can machine this feature has to run true to the shaft over here and the face here so that was the reason and also this this kind of helps you get the part in the in the chuck believe it or not because with this long shaft going up in the spindle it, there's no way to balance this thing too good and so if you put the strap on the other side of this bushing this bushing's about a half an inch thick on the radius and you can kind of start the start it in the chuck jaws here with a strap behind it if you have a thin strap and then you can pull the strap out and wiggle the part in there otherwise it's it's extremely difficult to get this long shaft up in the spindle and balance it unless you had but see the hole in here the hole isn't in the shaft or none of these holes at the time you put it in the chuck so it's kind of tricky to get a part like this in the chuck and this kind of helps a little bit because you can then if you get the bushing started about this far into the jaws with the part setting kind of like this in the spindle you can pull the strap out and then you can kind of slide it up in there and and straighten it as you tighten the chuck jaws so oddly enough that that kind of helps that too so i didn't really have time to do all that um, video on that end of the part but here's the other part on the pallet done i have to ship these parts today so unfortunately i didn't have time to make the video on that video the taking the part out of the chuck here so you kind of get an idea of um it's just the reverse of putting it in really the way you put the strap on and everything and it'll give you an idea of how this in a way this bushing helps you get a part like this in and out of the chuck without scratching up the od of the part so first thing i'm going to do is loosen these um chuck jaws and the part will tip back in the spindle and, and they'll hit the end of the part on the spindle bore but but it's not dragging or, or hitting any of the OD of the part on anything right at the moment. You see how it tipped back when I loosen. I always loosen number uh, one. This is number one jaw and this is number four jaw. When I'm dealing with this four jaw chuck so that when I put, if I'm putting another part in, I'm not in this case, but if I was, and then I would tighten these two jaws back up, it would be running fairly close to true to begin with before I indicated it in. So. Now I got those two jaws loose. And I gotta step in the machine here because I, I'm I gotta kind of slide the part out a little bit. I'm I'm up in the machine now and I have to kind of drag this thing out a little bit, but not all the way. Get out about that far. Now To rotate the c-axis so that I have the gap of the jaws sitting upward here and I got to work this strap through here see the easiest way to do that kind of need a thin strap for this otherwise you're not going to get it in here of course You see that gap between the jaws here, I can get the strap between it. I thought about sliding the part back in the bushing before I, you know, just loosen the jaws enough to where I could slide it back maybe, but I was worried about these shavings scratching the OD of the part that are in here. As you can see, the shavings in there. So I didn't do that. Now I got I've got the strap on the part. I'm gonna move it back as far as I can. And we're gonna lift the weight of the part on the crane here. Now it still won't really be balanced, but it'll be better. See, it's I got the weight on the crane now, and I can 
I can push down on this so I'm not dragging the end of the part against the spindle bore too much. Well, I'm just gonna pull it out of here. It's, uh, you can, I can kind of shove it down. You see all those shavings on it? I don't wanna drag that across the chuck jaws or anything. 